and good evening and a happy first night of Hanukkah. When I was in Israel, as the war broke out on the morning of Simchat Torah, I would say the real turning point for me where it felt like the world changed uh, was not when the initial sirens were going off in Jerusalem. I wasn't aware of what was happening in the broader context on Jewish holidays and the Sabbath. I don't use uh, my phone. Um, I went to a friend's house for lunch and he also is observant in a way, doesn't use his phone. So we weren't quite sure what was happening uh, until a neighbor of his came over and said that really this was a war that was starting. And he gave an estimate of how many people had been killed. And he also mentioned that I think at that point it was known that dozens of people, Israelis, had been taken hostage. And I know for me at that moment, it felt like the world had shattered and something new was emerging. We certainly didn't know the full extent, um, but I would say that I think the taking of hostages and what we've learned since then, just how many and their treatment is something that for many of us is very, very difficult to bear. And over the past couple of weeks, as some of those hostages have been released, we've been plagued both by strategic and moral questions, um, but also I think all of us can't help but celebrate watching the videos of those hostages coming home, being free and returning to their families. But the fact that Hamas has these hostages is just one of the ways in which we are dealing, all of us in the world, and Israel in particular, with the situation which is really um, one which um, is so non-ideal. We're acting with such a bad actor that it really raises some very, very difficult questions. And some of those have to do with fighting an insurgency. We addressed those uh, with Michael Walzer uh, shortly after the war began. And this evening, we are really blessed to have uh, another incredible mind with us who's an expert, not only in negotiations in general, but also how to deal with negotiating with someone who is really evil. And it is my pleasure to welcome here, Professor Bob Manukin. Bob, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Donnie. It's a pleasure to be here, although like you, it's painful to talk about this topic because of the horrific circumstances that have been created. Um, so we'll get into questions in a moment, but I do want to give you a, a due introduction. Uh, Robert Manukin is the Samuel Williston Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, and for 25 years served as the chair of the program on negotiation at Harvard Law School. He also directs the Harvard Negotiation Research Project, a leading scholar in the field of conflict resolution, he has applied his interdisciplinary approach to negotiation and conflict resolution to a remarkable range of problems, both public and private. A renowned teacher and lecturer, Professor Manukin has taught numerous workshops for corporations, governmental agencies, and law firms throughout the world, and trained many executives and professionals in negotiation and mediation skills. On behalf of the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, he designed and has taught annual workshops for intellectual property professionals. He has served as a consultant to governments, international agencies, major corporations, and law firms. As a neutral arbor, uh, arbitrator or mediator, he has also resolved numerous complex commercial disputes. Professor Manukin is a member of the Harvard Hillel Board of Directors, and he has written or edited 10 books and numerous scholarly articles. His most recent books include Kissinger, The Negotiator, uh, with another Harvard Hillel board member, James Sabinius, and um, Nicholas Burns, who was a, a guest on our program a couple of years ago. He's also written The Jewish American Paradox, Embracing Choice in a Changing World, and most relevant, I think, to tonight's program, his book, Bargaining with the Devil, When to Negotiate, When to Fight. I also want to thank our sponsor this evening, Suzanne Prebatch. These programs are made possible by sponsorship. And uh, you'll be happy to know, Bob, that Suzanne is sponsoring this program in honor of you and Dale Manukin. Well, isn't that lovely of her? I'll be certain to share that with Dale, who actually I think is watching. I think so, too. <laughs> um, so I want, I want to jump in. But before we get into your approach to negotiating, uh, can you begin by telling us a bit about your experience negotiating or consulting on negotiations? And then we'll get into some of the theory. Well, my interest in the topic really began when I was an undergraduate. Uh, I took a couple courses uh, from Thomas Schelling, who subsequently uh, won a Nobel Prize. And he was primarily interested from a game theoretical perspective in what he called strategic interaction. And that is 
when in fact decisions were being made where what you do depends on what the other person is going to do, but each of you is aware of the interaction. And he was uh, particularly concerned, this was at the height of the Cold War with the US-Soviet uh, 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 conflict and uh, bargaining relating to the use and development of nuclear weapons. Uh, later, uh, when I was in law school uh, at Harvard, uh, there was no course on negotiation. And I'm happy to say that uh, beginning uh, this coming year, negotiation is now going to be a required course, believe it or not, uh, uh, for law students, because I think we perceive it as being so central such a central lawyering skill and such an important human skill as well, because we all negotiate uh, all the time. Uh, my professional involvement as a neutral uh, really was launched because when I was at Stanford Law School, as a, I was asked to be an arbitrator and, and later a mediator as well in a huge dispute between IBM and Fujitsu over operating system software. And at that time, when I did this, I really had had very little practical experience, although I'd thought a lot about negotiation and bargaining. But as a result of that, because it was a young field, I suddenly was uh, assumed to be something of an expert. I've subsequently done lots of work, uh, much of it relating to commercial disputes, some of it relating to family disputes, and some, I've also been involved in some international disputes. Uh, I have, uh, in fact, uh, shortly after uh, the failure of President Clinton uh, to achieve a uh, breakthrough in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, I decided I really wanted to become involved studying and perhaps trying to help the some way uh, uh, with that conflict. And what I decided at the time, and regrettably it still remains true, was that the biggest barrier to the resolution of that conflict was in fact the internal conflicts within Israel on the one hand and the internal conflicts among Palestinians on the other hand. And those internal conflicts have made it extraordinarily difficult for a leader on either side to take the chances that would be involved politically uh, to bring about a resolution. Well, I, what I decided to do when I spent three years actually four years doing this, was seeing what I could do working on the internal conflict within Israel. And uh, over a period of more than a year, I spent putting together a group of Israelis, uh, ranging from the founder of Peace Now in Israel to two of the heads <clears throat> of uh, the Gesha Council, who were really the leaders of the settlement movement with some very important uh, Israeli former national security and political figures more in the middle. And we had a series of discussions because I really wanted to better understand and I, I hope to facilitate a deeper understanding on their part of this internal conflict. Now, as it happened, this all took place just before and then during the time uh, that Prime Minister Sharon decided to withdraw from Gaza. And in fact, uh, one thing I was rather proud of and our series of discussions may have helped somewhat is that that process of withdrawal from Gaza uh, which among Israelis was involved enormous conflict was nonviolent. And at that time, I also felt that it was terribly important for the Israeli government to treat very well 
the people from Gaza who had been settlers who were leaving because there were, of course, so many more on the West Bank that were watching this uh, closely. Uh, in all events, ever since then, I've, of I've I followed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict closely and have informally discussed it with a number of people, both publicly and privately, who have been uh, uh, quite involved. Uh, but alas, it's still with us. And uh, ironically, of course, this what's going on now, many people say is the result of Sharon's uh, earlier disengagement from Gaza, which at the time I thought was a very good thing. I think regardless of how we might think of that strategically, for those who don't remember when that happened, Israel was, I wouldn't quite say on the brink of a civil war, but it was far from clear uh, that it would be able to survive without internal violence uh, in a way that I think is reminiscent of what we saw just before the war broke out with these um, tensions surrounding the judicial reform. Um, but Baba, I want to turn a little bit now uh, to thinking about what's been going on. And starting broadly in your book, Bargaining with the Devil, you write, uh, a dispute must decide, should I bargain with the devil? or resist. And you continue by bargain, I mean attempt to make a deal, try to resolve the conflict through negotiation rather than fighting it out. By devil, I mean an enemy who has intentionally harmed you in the past or appears willing to harm you in the future, someone you don't trust, an adversary whose behavior you may even see as evil. This really sounds like Israel's situation in deciding to negotiate with Hamas. And I'll return uh, to the specifics of this in uh, a bit. But broadly speaking, what is the framework that you apply uh, to determine when and how to negotiate with a, a quote unquote devil? What struck me in working on my book, Bargaining with the Devil, was that in all kinds of contexts, ranging from international conflicts to commercial conflicts to family conflicts, uh, there was often uh, situations where people were having to decide, do I negotiate or do I refuse to negotiate and simply fight it out uh, with an adversary that I think is not only wrong, but may even be evil. And um, at the beginning of the book, I suggest that the, you hear voices that suggest both extremes. On the one hand, uh, there are some in my field who say you should always negotiate. Uh, after all, uh, uh, a settlement's typically far better than a, a protracted piece of litigation. Uh, and uh, diplomacy uh, is superior to a war where there can be hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people die. Uh, on the other hand, there are also people who say that when you have an enemy who's evil, uh, you should uh, never negotiate. Uh, the old Faustian bargain uh, suggests that uh, you're likely to soil your soul. Uh, your adversary may be uh, more clever than you are. Uh, and in fact, to make a deal, you're going to end up having to give your adversary the devil uh, something that in your view, you probably think he does not deserve at all. Now, in fact, my book is premised, you know, I think is probably characteristic of uh, many lawyers and law professors. I think things are rarely always or never. And uh, in my view, uh, whether you should negotiate or not depends upon a careful analysis of a lot of factors. And in my book, I have a character Mr. Spock, not Dr. Spock, who's the consummate, unemotional, rational actor. And he goes through a variety of questions that I think someone should ask themselves in deciding whether to negotiate or not. And in your book, you describe uh, a number of traps that prevent people from making a wise, a wise decision of when to negotiate. Can you outline some of uh, the key traps that you see? Yes, the, a, a big problem is particularly when, in your view, you're dealing with an adversary who's evil. Uh, and this conflict certainly involves both sides believing that about the other. Uh, there are a lot of what I call mental traps 
that can get in the way of uh, rational thinking. Uh, they include uh, tribalism, uh, uh, that uh, 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 an appeal to group identity, uh, where the view is uh, you're the good guys and have done nothing wrong, and the other side are bad guys who've done nothing ever right. They're always wrong. Uh, another trap is demonization, you know, literally, that you consider them as evil, and as a consequence, you don't trust them. And you think nothing they could say could be very uh, useful uh, in a negotiation. Uh, dehumanization is a third trap. You often hear in this conflict, both sides referring to the other almost in animalistic terms, uh, as if they're no longer human at all. Uh, a fourth trap is moralism and self-righteousness. Uh, we all know uh, what that could involve. Uh, finally, a very common trap in negotiations is what I call the zero-sum trap. And that is the idea that anything that's good for your adversary can't be good for you. Uh, this conflict involves a zero-sum game in that winning for one means necessarily a loss for the other along all dimensions. Uh, there are a couple other traps as well, but I think those are some of the main ones. So those, I think, are some of the, the main negative traps. But for every negative trap, you also have a positive trap um, right. that um, one who falls prey to that will jump into negotiations uh, either unwisely or too quickly. Uh, so what are some of those traps? Well, some of those traps are kind of uh, 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 the idea that every negotiation involves win-win opportunities where there are enormous opportunities to create value. There are some negotiations which, in fact, are pretty close to purely distributive. Uh, there are uh, a, a traps where you, in fact, uh, have a tendency to always think the best of other people. Uh, um, my focus in the book, though, because I think it's a much bigger problem, particularly when you're dealing with an adversary you think is evil, are the negative traps. And that's why really my emphasis is on those. I think it's unusual for the positive traps uh, to make a difference. Hmm. Um, so I, I think Israel is really dealing with perhaps two main questions surrounding negotiations. Uh, one is what we've all seen in the news more recently, which is about the hostages. Uh, and the second has to do with a larger question of negotiating either a potential long-term ceasefire or the terms of the conclusion to this war. But I want to start with um, the hostage situation. Um, can you walk us through how you might have advised Israel over the past few weeks if you were brought in as a consultant? Well, I think that the, the, the first thing to say, but let me start with the identification of the aims of both parties, okay? Because I think that backdrop is, is very important, right? You know, a, a, a one question, of course, is why in the world uh, did Hamas uh, attack Israel in the first place? Uh, uh, and I think that in fact, uh, why did they initiate this conflict? And I, I think that understanding those reasons is a helpful backdrop. Uh, I think a primary motive was to put the plight of the Palestinians back on the front page, to draw attention to it. Uh, I, what was happening contextually, of course, uh, was that it appeared that there might soon be some kind of Saudi-Israel deal of mutual, involving mutual recognition, uh, an extension of the earlier accords to Saudi Arabia, which of course is a very important, uh, uh, very important actor in the region. Uh, a third motive, of course, was by taking hostages, uh, Hamas. Uh, could trade them for Palestinian prisoners. And I think they also, in fact, uh, uh, had as a motive uh, to uh, enhance their standing 
uh, versus the Palestinian Authority with whom they've been in competition uh, and perhaps recruit new people to their cause. Uh, an, another, I think, conscious decision on their part is they had to know it was going to provoke retaliation by the Israelis. Uh, they just they couldn't have doubted that for a moment. And I think they thought that the retaliation uh, possibly could involve uh, a uh, counterproductive overreaction that would result in international condemnation of Israel. And to some degree, we've seen that already. Uh, all the visuals have involved the creation of a great deal of sympathy uh, for the Palestinian people, if not for Hamas, of course. Uh, and then finally, of course, they've had a long-term stated goal of the eradication of the Jewish state. This, in fact, was in its 1998 founding charter. Their subsequent charter, by the way, doesn't say that explicitly anymore, but instead emphasizes uh, the ending of occupation. But in all events, I think that's the backdrop of why they did it. Now, in response, Israel has stated quite explicitly three aims. One is to bring back the hostages, rescue the hostages. The second is to destroy Hamas. And the third is to ensure that Gaza can no longer be used as a base for terrorist attack. And what I want to note at the outset, of course, you raised the issue of negotiating for the hostages, is there's a tension between these goals. Because the war obviously puts the hostages at risk, uh, both directly and indirectly. Uh, and yet, in fact, uh, it, it's clear, it's re it, it, in terms of negotiating for hostages, uh, uh, the, the, um, what's happened so far is very much in the tradition of what happened before. And that was, there was a prisoner swap of sorts where uh, some number of women and children uh, have been exchanged for the release of Palestinian uh, uh, prisoners. Uh, and I think that in fact, uh, that involved probably a good deal of haggling of how many for how many, but I, I, I wanna make one preliminary observation. I suspect the Israelis understand that they will, as long as the war continues, Hamas will not voluntarily negotiate a release of all the hostages, because those hostages provide them leverage in terms of the war. So in, to that degree, there's a real tension between Israel's stated goals. And so how might you advise them? Uh, so it seems like there needs to be, I guess, a clarification for Israel on well, I what think its goals are and how Israel, to prioritize them. It, Israel ought to try to secure uh, as many hostages to either rescue or to bargain for as many hostages as possible. Uh, but uh, for reasons we can describe, I think it, given their other objectives, uh, they will not agree uh, to a permanent ceasefire. Uh, and indeed, uh, what uh, all those calling for a ceasefire can't really answer is if an Israeli said, well, what are we going to get out of a ceasefire after, in terms of our second two objectives, <laughs> and that is to destroy Hamas and make sure Gaza becomes demilitarized, uh, what are we going to secure in terms of those two objectives by a ceasefire? We won't. Hamas will remain in power. Uh, and in fact, uh, their reputation would be enhanced and we would have further to some degree, of course, encourage further hostage taking. So I think that um, the net of that is, I think that it's, I, I think that Israel is, is more than happy to negotiate for hostages and probably is willing to exchange many, many more prisoners to get the hostages out. 
Uh, but I think it's very unlikely, and I think the Israelis understand this, uh, that from the other side's perspective, to release all the hostages is to give up their leverage. I'll say that I think at the beginning of the war, what you were hearing from the Israeli government was very much a sense of, uh, you know, because the atrocities uh, were so horrific that they were going to kind of put the hostages uh, aside in terms of how they were going to um, persecute this, prosecute this war. Um, but uh, I think that's shifted over time for various reasons. Um, I just want to remind everyone, we will be taking Q&A in a few minutes. There's a Q&A icon that you can click on at the bottom of your screen, type your question in there. Uh, if we choose your question, we will promote you to become a panelist to turn on your audio and video and ask your question directly, but we can only do that if we know who you are. So please make sure that you ask your question by name and not uh, anonymously. Uh, so Bob, I want to ask you, uh, you know, you talked about these various objectives that Israel will have securing the release of hostages, demilitarizing uh, Gaza. But there are other interests that Israel has, including its standing in the international community. Um, and so I'm curious how much you think Israel should or does weigh that, and perhaps also more locally to, say, Harvard's campus. Um, what do you think of, how much do you think Israel should be weighing the sentiment that we're seeing uh, on Harvard's campus and elsewhere? How, how much should they be concerned with the popular sentiment and how much of that way in their thinking about uh, moving forward and ultimate negotiations with Hamas. Well, let's let's uh, uh, break that down. Uh, I think they are should be concerned with the impact on Israel's uh, reputation internationally, but I I believe that what we've got to keep in mind is that for many Israelis, they see this fight with Hamas as existential or, or nearly existential uh, in, in terms of the long-term survival of Israel. Uh, they find a terrorist attack, understandably, of this scale, absolutely intolerable. And so when there are national security interests that a country views as absolutely core. Uh, typically, of course, that those interests receive very, very high priority. And they may have other interests as well, but I know in Israel, many feel, many Israelis feel that they're always being criticized by the international community because of a double standard. And they view it to some degree with some cynicism. Uh, that's not to say that there might not be costs. Uh, there certainly could be economic costs, uh, and there could be other costs in terms of um, international reprobations of various sorts. Uh, in terms of uh, what's happening on campuses, um, I think that Israel is no doubt concerned with the increase in anti-Semitism uh, that's now being seen all over the world. And I think that this relates uh, to some substantial degree uh, to this war and to the conflict with Palestinians. Uh, and that should be, I would hope, a concern of it, uh, Israel. I think Israel should be especially concerned. You know, the New York Times had an article, I believe it was today, about the generational differences in American Jewish families of attitudes towards this conflict. It's much more common for young people who don't have the same historical experience, don't feel the same connection with Israel, its creation, its earlier wars, as my generation does. Uh, there, there, I think Israel is probably quite concerned with the impact on the next generation of American Jews. Uh, of this compact, uh, of this. And I think that's something uh, I think they, I hope they're concerned with because I think we all should be concerned with. Uh, uh, now on on the Harvard campus, uh, you, know, on, you know, and campuses all over the country, uh, uh, there are real conflicts among students uh, that uh, earlier had uh, been friends. And I think many students on campuses are experiences what they see as anti-Semitism 
often for the first time. And I think that what's especially painful is that many of uh, Harvard Jewish undergraduates see themselves as progressives. And by progressives, I mean they are sympathetic to the women's movement, to black rights, to Hispanic rights, to gay rights. And I think what's extremely painful for them, many of the organization, student organizations relating to those topics about which they feel sympathy in terms of their uh, assertions uh, have aligned with Palestinian groups and have in some instances really uh, excluded Jews from participation in other activities. And I think that's been enormously painful uh, uh, for many. So I think it's a, I think it's a serious problem, and obviously, it's a very hard time to be a university administrator. <laughs> That's clear. Uh, uh, of of on the one hand, maintaining the university of a place where uh, free speech and academic inquiry uh, is uh, treated with great importance, but on the other hand, uh, in uh, 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 protecting its students from what they feel is often harassment, exclusion, uh, and other forms of uh, anti-Semitism. Um, yeah, and you've also written on uh, you know, the state of American jury in general and thinking about the next generation. Um, yeah, I'm curious, do you have a sense that, that for Israel, there may be a, a point where they feel like there's too big a rift between them and the younger American Jewish community and that that might be a sacrifice they're willing to make. Sacrifice in what sense? They're losing the support of the next generation of America. Of Jews. losing it. No, no. Look, I think that given that they view this current war as involving very basics relating to their national security. I think they'd be prepared, yes, that they may decide that's that's a price we're gonna have to pay. Like the price they are paying in terms of uh, a fair degree of international condemnation because of the number of uh, non-combatant civilians, women, especially women and children that are being killed in uh, Gaza. I want to ask one more question about Israel's uh, broader strategy. Uh, in your book, you talk about spillover costs. Uh, negotiating with one party you know, may adversely affect you in future dealings with other parties. Right. And I was recently in uh, Israel, I met with uh, a Harvard alum who's very involved with uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace building there. Um, and he said the one thing uh, that he thinks important to uh, that to keep in mind that many he thinks in America are not thinking about um, is that, you know, you raised earlier in our conversation uh, that Hamas may have perpetrated this attack now to kind of thwart Israel's budding relationship with Saudi Arabia in order to provoke a large response. And then Saudi Arabia would have to say, you know, we can't move forward with this if there are so many uh, dead Palestinians. And uh, this former student actually said he thinks of it a little bit differently, that actually what many in the region are looking for is to see just how strong Israel is. And if Israel actually does respond strongly, including the potential uh, civilian casualties that will be necessary uh, to either fully eradicate Hamas or um, highly restrict its ability to, uh, to attack Israel, uh, that that actually could strengthen Israel's standing in the region. And it's only a strong Israel uh, that other countries actually have an interest in normalizing relationships with, primarily Saudi Arabia. So I'm curious your take on that in general, and also maybe just more broadly, how in a negotiation like this, the actions that one party can take to further its uh, its standing and its strength in in the negotiations. Well, look, I I, I think what your uh, friend is essentially saying two things. First, by standing strong and be willing to really uh, fight to el eliminate. Hamas's capacity, military capacity. Uh, uh, Israel is uh, 
showing its ability and willingness to fight, and that will have a deterrent effect on others. Uh, and in fact, the other thing I think he's suggesting, which is probably true, is many of the Arab countries that are, of course, condemning Israel for bombing so much, uh, would probably love to be rid of Hamas. It's not as if they have many governments that are actively supporting uh, Hamas or really would be uh, very unhappy if Hamas uh, uh, disappeared as a, a potent force. Uh, third party effects, you know, look, uh, this uh, uh, war also could have an impact on uh, Israel's relationship with the United States. Uh, I think that obviously we haven't talked about it. We may not have time tonight, but a, a huge problem is the day after problem, what's called the day after problem. And that is assume that militarily Israel succeeds in uh, suppressing Hamas says military capacity because they destroy arms caches, et cetera, and they kill the current group of leaders. I mean, a, a, a big problem is, of course, which others have noted, is what's it mean to destroy Hamas? It's an ideology, a, a religiously based ideology. Uh, you kill these leaders, what's to stop other leaders from emerging? What's to stop a similar uh, political movement emerging? which has also is willing to use military force, armed uh, resistance uh, uh, to fight Israel. And the question in Gaza of what happens if you've repressed Hamas, what's gonna, who's gonna govern Gaza thereafter? And uh, what's very interesting, of course, is the United States has already explicitly said that it does not want Israel to engage in a long-term occupation of Gaza. And of course, Israelis have no real interest in a long-term occupation. But on the other hand, uh, Netanyahu in the last two days has made clear that the IDF is going to be in charge of internal security for Israel within Gaza uh, after the war. And I suspect there's going to be, uh, at least for some period of time, some form of Israeli occupation. And in the longer term, you know, the question of who, in fact, is going to govern Gaza is a terribly difficult problem. Ultimately, of course, I mean, what probably Israel would like is there be something akin to the Palestinian Authority with sufficient standing uh, to do that. Uh, but uh, Abu Mazen and the current Palestinian Authority certainly doesn't have that capacity. It's viewed as corrupt. Its leaders, leader is in his late 80s. Uh, he's not had an election for a long time, in part because of the fear that in the West Bank, uh, Hamas might secure 30% of the votes. So the day after is a big problem, and I'm sure Israel's worried about it, but uh, it's not clear what the intermediate run solution is going to be. Well, Bob, thank you so much uh, for answering my questions. I've got plenty more, but we have a number of questions coming in already uh, from our audience. A reminder, if you have a question, you can hit that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen, type it in by name. Uh, please only do so if you're willing to then come on, as Nadine Jacobson has done, and ask your question uh, directly. Um, but we're going to go now uh, to Nadine, who's uh, a lawyer and an alum of Harvard. Nadine, it's great to see you, and thanks for joining us. Please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. This has been very interesting. And Professor Manuka, and I'm also a graduate of the law school, and I did take negotiation workshop when I was there over 30 years ago. So <laughs> it's helped me a lot in my career. Um, well, you're you're much younger than I am. You see, I graduated <laughs> many years before you did, and they didn't offer it then. Anyway, um, so my question is this. I, I read in the news today that Israel says they're very close to surrounding the senior leadership of Hamas, including the possible leader of Hamas. And if that were to happen... Uh, you know, what do you think Israel should do? They've still got hostages. Killing the top leadership isn't necessarily going to enable Israel to find and and rescue all the hostages. And I wonder, you know, capturing them, how would, what would, if you were in this position, what should they do in terms of the leverage they have if they actually do 
capture these people or are at risk of killing these people, how does that complicate things for Israel, not just in terms of the day after problem, but in terms of rescuing the hostages, which really is what concerns me? Well, what you're suggesting is, of course, a possibility that uh, now whether Israel would exchange uh, the leaders responsible for the horror uh, of October 7th uh, for the remaining hostages is a question I don't I certainly don't know the answer to. I think uh, it's not like releasing uh, rock throwers who are in Israeli uh, prisons now. Uh, or, or even people who some years ago may have may have engaged in much more violent activities, uh, but it 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 may well give Israel uh, uh, some leverage. I think that the challenge uh, militarily of finding and rescuing uh, all of the remaining hostages is a terribly difficult problem, and I I think that as Donnie uh, suggested earlier, uh, early on, it was really reasonably clear that of the three goals that I identified, Israel was putting the real emphasis on the second and the third, and that was to destroy Hamas and to, uh, in fact, uh, uh, try to demilitarize Gaza, even if that meant sacrificing ho some hostages. And I think, in fact, although they certainly don't talk about it this way because it's just too gruesome for words, but I think that at the policy level, that's what they really have implicitly decided. That's very yeah. sad to hear, but I think you're probably right. Nadine, thanks uh, so much. Thank you, Nadine. Joining. Come back for your reunions. <laughs> I do, I do, I will. <laughs> Good. We're going to go now to, uh, to Susan Seliman, who's on faculty here at Harvard and also an alum did her PhD here. Susan, thanks so much for joining. Please go ahead and ask your question. Right. She's also a dear friend, but she yes. always asks Hello, very Bob. Tough... I'm so glad to see you. Well, I'm I know so you always to... ask tough questions, too. Uh, so glad to see you, to see Dale behind you. That's such a lovely photo. Uh, so, well, the question that I put up on the Q&A is really... You know, Tom Friedman has been writing what uh, I mean, I, I'm so like so many other people were so upset by what is happening there. I'm, I'm, you know, so but I think some of what he has been writing or much of what he has been writing is what I feel, too. In other words, overreaction on the part of Israel has just been very counterproductive in many ways. Uh, uh, the idea of completely eliminating Hamas is, as you pointed out, really not possible because if you kill the ones that are there now, new ones will arise. So his last, the one, the latest uh, suggestion that I read and that I was asking for your opinion on was, you know, why, <clears throat> why does it Israel uh, offer a permanent ceasefire to Hamas in exchange for all the hostages? No, no other, no other, no prisoner swap, just give us back our hostages and we will stop bombing you. And he was explaining, you know, if Hamas refuses that, at least it will make itself look very bad internationally, because what it would be saying is, we want to go on fighting you. And even if more 10, more thousand Gazans die in the process, that's okay with us. You know, in other words, uh, this, I, this notion that Israel could do something truly innovative rather than just overreacting the way it has been doing something really new something that would change the situation uh i was well, wondering whether you had any other ideas that might change the situation well the, I, I too read uh that editorial and i think friedman has written as always many very intelligent things i did not think that was uh a good one. Uh, likely to happen. For, for uh, I, I think that if Hamas accepted, most Israelis would simply see this as a repeat of what happened a number of times before. And that is there was a Hamas attack. Israel bombed for a while. There were calls for a ceasefire. There was a ceasefire. And sometimes there were prisoners exchanged. Often there were, there were other situations that involved prisoner exchanges. And I think that the feeling within Israel is 
and it extends, I'm not saying this is correct, I'm being descriptive. Within Israel, I am very struck by the breadth of support for going after Hamas and trying to end their control of Gaza. And uh, because I, I say this because some professional friends who were deeply involved in the Oslo process and have devoted their lives to the peace process within Israel, one of them recently wrote to me and said, I think there's no prospect for any kind of long-term peace so long as Hamas governs Gaza. And I, so that's, and that's somebody on the left. I mean, not maybe the most extreme left, but the left. And of course the right, you know, you know how, how they feel. So I think given those political realities within Israel, I think it's very unlikely Israel would offer that. I don't think it's so unlikely that Hamas wouldn't accept it. <laughs> really? Because, you think so? Oh, well, listen, I mean, because I think Hamas realizes that in the long run, militarily, they can't win this militarily. I mean, Israel has a huge modern army. Now, in the long run, not, not in terms of the next months, I'm not sure military force is going to be sufficient. But Hamas has to realize that, too. I mean, Israel has mobilized so many more soldiers than Hamas has. And Gaza is a small area. And get, if you're willing to sacrifice enough, they, they can do it. Uh, they can not permanently destroy Hamas, but they can put them out of business for a while. So, you have to say at what cost, though, at what cost. Exactly. So can you think of anything innovative that Israel might do? Or, you know, well, I, I think the real alternative for Israel, uh, or, or an alternative, uh, is at some point, be prepared to live with much stronger border protection uh, uh, to have the capacity to intervene in Gaza when it's necessary, but in fact, not try to occupy Gaza. Uh, uh, and uh, I don't know enough Obviously, what they had was insufficient. And of course, part of the reason it was insufficient is because the army, too much of the army had been redeployed to the West Bank to protect settlers rather than Gaza. Uh, uh, but I, I guess what I think a possible alternative, and this isn't original with me, but is one where you really beef up border security. Now, whether it could be sufficient, I'm not sure. Uh, but I think it might, in fact, substantially diminish it and, and really eliminate the possibility that you could have 2,000 people come through <laughs> to attack villages near the Gaza border. Susan, thanks for joining and for your question. Uh, we're going to turn out to Alex Sagan, who may be Robert, you also know, uh, former board member of Harvard Hillel and also does PhD here at Harvard. Alex, it's wonderful to see you. And we actually, Alex and I saw each other on the plane heading to Israel um, just before uh, the attacks. And I haven't seen your face since then, Alex. So it's nice to see you again. Nice Hi, to Alex. See you too. Nice to see you. Hi, Bob. How are you? Good to see Good. you. So I posted two questions in the chat. One of them was similar to what Susan asked. So I'll ask the other one, which is as a negotiation expert, Looking at what's happening on campuses now, what would be your proposal for uh, trying to improve the campus climate? Certainly Jews and Israelis on campus are very alarmed by the sort of scary mood of rising anti-Semitic anti expression. And there's a widespread feeling, I think, that the administrations of the universities haven't done enough to set a tone, to clarify expectations, and to distinguish between free speech and incitement. And so we've got a situation that for a lot of Jews on campus is quite alarming. And I know that there are some 
Palestinian and Arab students who are also distressed by the situations on campus but from a very, very different point of view. Um, what would you propose, especially since the administrations don't seem to know what they're doing, um, for trying to improve the situation? Well, I think some of the things uh, that are being done and are just being initiated are promising. Uh, first of all, I think for universities to do what is Harvard has stated that it's going to begin to do, and that is, in fact, treat anti-Semitism as a serious problem uh, along all dimensions and do a great deal of education. Uh, I think the need for education is terribly important. Uh, I think that the administration initially didn't, not because in any way I think they are anti-Semitic, but they did not understand, given our history, how deeply disturbing what happened in October was, what it brought back in terms of historical memories. And, um, uh, and I think they didn't understand it because, in fact, they probably hadn't talked enough to Jewish friends <laughs> about their reactions. Um, uh, I think that, though, uh, education can play a very important role. The other thing that, in fact, uh, we've talked about at Harvard Hillel, if possible, I think it would be very a very good thing for the Harvard Jewish chaplain and the Harvard Muslim chaplain to sponsor and engage in some small group discussions. Because I think at that level, my impression at Harvard, for example, those two have a very good relationship. And I think both symbolically and in reality, that would be a really good thing. A third thing, and you know, it's really at the core of our educational function. I think there are people on both sides who are very ignorant about the dimensions of this dispute between Israel and Palestinians and, and its complexity. And I think understanding it better doesn't eliminate all conflict, but I think it makes a real difference if you're prepared to try to understand a conflict from the other person's perspective as well as your own. And teaching people that they can do that without giving up their own values and their own concerns of what they think is important. So those are the kinds of things that I think would be very important to do. None of them is going to be an immediate or, or, or quick cure. I think also when, in fact, student groups engage in harassment uh, or any kinds of threats when they interfere with classes, it's very important for universities to be prepared to sanction that behavior and not simply tolerate it. There are, of course, uh, the values underlying the First Amendment. Hate speech, unfortunately, is protected by the First Amendment. The Supreme Court has so ruled, uh, but that hate speech that, that threatens incitement of violence and at Harvard, hate speech that can amount to harassment uh, or interference with the educational process, of course, can be sanctioned. And it should be. I think, um, well, first of all, Alex, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we have a follow-up to this, maybe. Um, someone else who you'll recognize, Bob, um, <laughs> Rebecca Thau is a former um, student president of Harvard Hill, now a rabbinical student in New York. Uh, so Rebecca, At Central ahead, Synagogue, no less. <laughs> indeed, indeed. It's wonderful to see you, Bob. Thank you so much uh, for doing this this talk. It's always a privilege to to get to learn from you and to see you. So exciting. Well, I can call um, you rabbi now, can't I? Not quite. Almost there. It's five years. Very long. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my question is indeed in, in line with this and, and, and in some ways as a follow up. I am curious. Um, if you have any particular comments on or response to the congressional hearing as of two days ago in which our president, Gay, was among the university presidents who was questioned on anti-Semitism on campus. Um, and I'll, I'll say as a, as a young alumna that there has been 
concern about about what her uh, her not just her response but her and the other responses um, might convey. Uh, and so I'm curious what your um, what your response or comment to to that hearing more broadly uh, is. Well, I, I in fact uh, deeply believe that President Gay is working hard to combat anti-Semitism on campus and to deal with what is an extremely complicated issue. The Republicans on those committees were out to trap the presidents. And what they were out to do, I mean, what in fact President Gay said that sanctioning students would depend on the context uh, is in terms of First Amendment principles, 100% right. Politically, it, with the benefit of hindsight, she could have done it in a better way. If she had begun by saying that the kinds of statements that were uh, that the students presumably were doing uh, would be uh, were reprehensible and should be condemned as such, but whether in fact the university could sanction it is a more complicated problem because and which would depend on. Uh, whether it related to incitement, et cetera. Uh, and, and, and that longer elaboration might have given her some more protection. But I think this is a terribly difficult time to be a, a, the head of a university. I'm, uh, for personal reasons, very sympathetic to the complexities of it uh, because my own daughter now is the head of uh, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. But uh, knock on wood, so far, I think she's handled it really very well. Rebecca, great to see you. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday at our Hanukkah party in New York City. Uh, we're going to turn quickly to our final question for the evening. Michael Freemark is uh, on faculty at the uh, Duke School of Medicine. Michael, please go ahead and ask your question. We have a hard stop at nine, so let's try and be quick okay, here. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry to break up the Harvard party, but nice to see my friends of Duke of the North. Uh, so, Bob, thanks. This is really interesting. Uh, you have two parties that have uh, stated objectives that are in mortal conflict. The Israelis are, just, as you said, are, are determined to eliminate or eradicate Hamas. Hamas is determined to eradicate uh, the state of Israel, and I, this must be a negotiator's nightmare, but uh, I, I'm wondering, in your experience, um, do you think it's possible to force, either through pressure or persuasion, uh, two parties that have totally irreconcilable ideological conflicts into a a, a solution, a, a negotiation in which a, a, a solution is actually re achieved. Uh, in this context, I think it, it's going to be very difficult. Obviously, the United States has some substantial degree of leverage. Uh, but on the other hand, because these are it, what Israel views as vital national security issues, there are really limits to what we can achieve. Uh, obviously, uh, we can threaten to provide less aid. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that might not have some effect. But I think given the seriousness uh, with which Israel takes the security threat, I'm not confident of that. And of course, on the other side, there probably are uh, Arab countries that might be able to put some leverage on uh, Hamas. But once again, you know, on the ground in Gaza, I'm not so sure. Uh, they could, once again, by cutting off support, probably exercise some leverage. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, I think do you think it's possible for a negotiator to convince one or more or the other party that, in fact, these goals are not totally irreconcilable, that there is room for rethinking it? Well, I think that the, the thing that one would emphasize is that they have other interests as well. 
and that security is not all or nothing, and that there might be ways uh, to resolve this uh, with um, better security, partial disarmament, some kinds of inspections, et cetera, uh, where it's not a total victory or total loss for either side. So yes, I think there are possibilities, uh, but um, I don't think the parties are there yet. And uh, um, whether in fact it happens, I'm not sure. Michael, thanks so much uh, thank for you, joining. Michael. You're always welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Very interesting. Bob, thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Uh, we're all, I think, greatly uh, appreciative. We had over 500 people on this call tonight, so clearly a, a lot of interest. And I want to wish you and Dale a uh, happy Hanukkah. And once again, thank you to Suzanne Prebetch for sponsoring tonight's program and a happy Hanukkah to one and all. Uh, it certainly is a dark time in many ways, and hopefully the candles can shed a little bit of light. And uh, more metaphorically, we can also be lights onto the world. Thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, Donnie.